Well, thank you. Thank you, Janie, and thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a real, real privilege for me to be here tonight. Hey, I need to do one demographic thing just to check. Um, how many people in here um, served in the U.S. military? Okay. And, and how many people are here in here are family members of people who served in the U.S. military? Yeah. Welcome to North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, you're probably aware, but the state that we're currently in has among the highest propensity in the U.S. for people who serve in the service. So tonight's subject, where we'll talk about the fighting that's been going on since the attacks on September 11, 2001, around our state, there's a lot of people who participated in this. Almost every unit that we have in the state, from the active forces, the National Guard, and the service reserves, have all deployed, not once, but multiple times. And, uh, and so this is something we all need to think about. Um, I wish I could tell you that the message I'm going to give you tonight is going to make you happy and you're going to go home all charged up. You should be happy and proud of the men and women who fight on our behalf. Um, they have done everything we have asked of them. The one thing I will tell you is I think sometimes we haven't asked them to do the right thing. And, right. and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. So here's one of them. Uh, this is picture from 12 years ago. This is Sergeant Danny Lackman um, from the United States Army. He's currently First Sergeant Danny Lackman out with the 25th Infantry Division in, in Hawaii, and he's preparing to deploy to Afghanistan. That'll be his sixth deployment. Um, but Danny, there he is that picture. If you look in Iraq in July 2005 in the city of Ramadi, on our, on our walls there, the, uh, the locals have put some stuff in Arabic, and they've translated it for us helpfully. It says, slow death. And that is what our enemy wishes on us. They have drawn us into a series of these long-term, indecisive wars, and their goal is to keep us there long enough to get what they want out of it. So that's what we're going to talk about. And um, we're going to start with a little look at, at one of these particular fights. So... Roger. Bison 25. M4, M4, M4. Bison 25. M4, 
Take your time. Get Come your on, head. Get, get your head. Get your head. Okay, and I know that uh, if you if you look at YouTube or if you watch the evening news, you can see things like this all the time. What can I tell you about this particular fight? A couple things. First of all, in this this afternoon fight, morning afternoon, same road, which was the road between Ramadi and Fallujah. Habaniya was an old Royal Air Force base from the British Royal Air Force. They used it when they used to occupy Iraq, and actually had a fight there with the Germans in 1940 in World War II. Um, so what you saw were two improvised explosive device, roadside bombs, one in the morning that was ineffective, and you heard the small arms fire, it was an ambush. The one in the afternoon, much more effective, tied together, three 152 millimeter Russian uh, artillery shells, buried them in the road, detonated it, drove the one truck off the road. The side of the truck where that detonated, Staff Sergeant Bob Hernandez from Baltimore, Maryland was sitting there, he was killed instantly. The other three guys aboard that truck were badly wounded. The one individual, you saw several people get out to return fire and to fight. That was, and you, the truck you were watching that had the dash cam was fi firing as well. There was also AK and PKM machine gun fire coming back the other way. Um, unlike movies, they don't fire all tracers so you can see it, but it's definitely there. And, uh, and then the other thing that I would mention is that the, uh, the one individual, that's why I highlighted him with the laser pointer, that was the medic. Um, the, the, medical, uh, the medical people are brave beyond belief, and they, he knew those people in the truck needed help, and he ran down there to, get, to help them. And uh, fortunately, he was not killed. There was enough covering fire that he was able to make it down the slope and over to that truck and, and help save the three people who did survive. There were five insurgents killed, and uh, we pulled their bodies out of the tree line that you can barely see in the distance here. They were backed off here, and they used... Um, the markers on the side of the road to detonate those artillery shells and to engage the ambush. Um, one question I will ask you, what's the weather like on the day of this event? Rainy. Rainy. Which, which favors who? The enemy. The enemy, right, because the United States has ex extensive air power and capabilities up in the air, so the enemy will wait till the weather is bad, and that is when they will strike, and we have to carry out operations all the time. What I've just shown you here goes on day and night, in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Syria. This is the war that the people from our state and from across the country are fighting every day and night. And it's going to be, it, it goes on and on and on. What I'm going to talk about this evening is how did we get to the situation where this is what we're putting our young men and women to do, and what's the point of it all? Um, we'll start back where this one started. Now look, if you talk to the to the inserting the terrorist groups that fight us, some of these jokers want to start the clock, you know, they want to talk about what happened with the Iranian Revolution in 79, or they want to talk about the U.S. Marines in Lebanon in 82, 83, or they, they might want to go back to the split up of the Ottoman Empire in 1918, or, uh, well, I mean, they, believe me, they go back further than that. They start complaining about the Crusades that, you know, uh, hell, they go all the way back to Cain and Abel, you know, and, and stuff like that. But the bottom line is, a lot of grievances in that part of the world. One of those grievances came to our country on September 11, 2001. And, um, and you all in this room know what happened, but it's important to remember, I, you know, I, I have the, the privilege to teach at North Carolina State University. My average students were all toddlers when this occurred. They have no personal memory of 9-11. They don't remember it at all. To me, it's as vivid as if it happened 10 minutes ago, and it, and it changed my life personally. I mean, it's what sent me to combat for a total of four years. It changed the life of my son, who's an Iraq and Afghanistan veteran, and it changed the life of many people in this room. But this is, this is what pulled the American people in to this war in this part of the world. So there, there's the, the day, 2,977 killed, of which about all but a, about 300 were Americans. There were foreigners from 90 different countries who were also killed that day. This includes the people aboard the four planes. 
The enemy was so insidious, they chose American and United flights because they thought, because they, those have red, white, and blue colors in their names, they thought they were the official airlines of the United States. All right? So, you know, but, um, but they, that showed you how little the enemy really knew of us. Um, here, of course, the front page of the New York Times, um, you know, which, which then, now, and always is, the, you know, the, the, the newspaper, the American establishment. This is end-of-the-world headlines for them. I mean, this was huge. And, of course, this is from the actual um, surveillance video at the Pentagon. Um, the American Airlines Flight 77 actually bounced on the helipad and then went into that Pentagon. The Pentagon had been built, interestingly enough, construction started on September 11th, 1941. But, um, but that Pentagon, when it was built by Leslie Groves, General Leslie Groves, the same guy who later supervised the atomic bomb program for the military, um, they built that in 18 months. And, um, and it was designed to withstand a World War II bombing raid. As a result, less people were killed at the Pentagon than in the Twin Towers, even though there's 25,000 people in that building, because it was built to take that kind of a hit. Sadly, we lost everybody on the plane. And, um, and when we found out, we did our homework, you know, who did this? These were the people, this is where the hijackers were from. 15 of them from Saudi Arabia, two from the United Arab Emirates, one from Egypt, one from Lebanon, all right? And that were, those were the hijackers. And the mastermind behind it, and we knew this by that afternoon, was this guy, Osama bin Laden. And Osama bin Laden, uh, you know, he, he loved this kind of outfit. He wore it all the time. This is an AKR, which is a, a Soviet Army um, carbine that was favored by their airborne forces. He claimed he captured it in a firefight as a member of the Mujahideen when he was fighting in Afghanistan, actually working for the side we supported at the time. This is a U.S. issue battle dress uniform field jacket that he'd gotten off the Pakistanis who we worked for at that time as well. Um, and Bin Laden, this guy's not a poor guy or anything like that. He's a dead guy now, fortunately, but, uh, but he was not poor. He came from one of the richest families in Saudi Arabia. His dad was a big building contractor, did major projects, and Osama himself was a graduate of King Abdulaziz University, you know, the, the, um, the NC state of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, I guess. But, uh, but he, had a, he was a construction guy. His nickname was the contractor, and he had done construction in support of the forces that were fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. He was the guy who organized all this. And, and so one of the questions we had right away after September 11th, and I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think we got it right on, on the afternoon of September 11th. I still think we don't have it right, is this question. Who is our enemy? Who is the enemy? You know, On the afternoon of September 11th, they, the CIA and the, uh, the other intelligence organizations, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, came in and they told President Bush, they said, this guy bin Laden belongs to an organization called Al-Qaeda, the base and they are headquartered um, in the Middle East. They were headquartered in the country of Afghanistan. And the head guys of this were two guys, Bin Laden, who's dead, and Ayman al-Zawahiri. Now, he was actually the, also the leader of Islam, Egyptian Islamic Jihad. These two guys are sort of like Kentucky Fried Chicken and Taco Bell. You know, they made a merger, but they kept their individual menus. He's still alive, Zawahiri. We haven't gotten him yet. Although the, the leadership of Al-Qaeda, the core leadership that planned the 9-11 attacks could fit in the first two rows of this room. A very small group of people, hardly any, all right, very, very tiny. You need to think of Al-Qaeda not as like the Nazi Germans or the Imperial Japanese or the North Koreans or something. You need to think of them more like a criminal gang, and that's what they are, although a very capable one. And uh, they organized what they called the Plains Operation. Now, their headquarters, where they were on September 11, 2001, was Afghanistan. And they were the guests of the Taliban, a fundamentalist religious group that was running Afghanistan at the time. They had been among, the Taliban had been among the guys who fought the Soviet Union in the 80s with our support. And then there was a civil war in Afghanistan, and they took over. And, uh, and the head guy of the Taliban was this guy here, Mullah Omar. And at, if, if you think his right, something's wrong with his right eye, it is. The Russians shot it out in 1986 during a, a firefight during that war. And uh, he's the host with the most. He basically invited bin Laden and Zawahiri and al-Qaeda in. He said, you can use my country for planning and training. You can do whatever you want. I'll support you. I will help you. So the Americans, as we're trying to figure out who, who's to blame for this and what we're going to do, this is our initial target set. We're going to go after these guys. There was also a question, though, about this guy, who we'd already fought one major war against, 
who our Air Force and Navy and Marines were flying every day, air missions over his country, who made all kinds of outrageous things about what he was going to do, who, who when we went into that country in 91, he had chemical, biological, nuclear programs going. And this guy was, was mouthing off, saying all kinds of things that indicated he was in support of these people. And so there was a question, you know, what about him? Well, the military, of course, said, look, one, you know, let's uh, fry one fish at a time here. We'll go with this guy. So President Bush correctly called in his, his leaders. He, um, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the start of the war was actually General Hugh Shelton uh, right from here in North Carolina. And uh, so he called in General Shelton and the other military guys. And he says, what do you got for me? What can we do? He says, I'm not going to handle this as a police action. I'm not going to put yellow tape around the hole of the World Trade Center, you know, and, and wait to go make an arrest with a warrant. He says, I'm going to treat this as a war. So what, what war plans have you military guys got? Well, basically, the U.S. military, up until 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we had one war plan, which was to fight World War III against the Soviet communists. When they went away... We broke the war plan into two parts. We disbanded parts of our military, but the part that we kept, we broke it into two parts. One part was focused on the North Koreans in Northeast Asia. And uh, by the way, there's still a problem. By the way, that is a real aerial photogra uh, satellite photograph of North Korea. That little dot there is Pyongyang. All right? And um, some people look at that and say, well, you can just see how, how they have so little electricity. They do have a lot less electricity than, than South Korea or China or Japan. But they also are on a wartime footing. They're under nighttime blackout, okay, because they're expecting an attack from us at any moment. And, you know, the way things are going, we might oblige them. Um, so the, the North Koreans were one of our main war plans in 2001. We ran annual exercise like Ultra Focus Lens, the U.S. version of that called Ultra Freedom Guardian. And if you look at this picture, this is a stage picture. That's a U.S. Marine. Republic of Korea Marine coming ashore at the beach down south in Pohang. We prepared to run the second Korean War, if you will, all the time. That was one of our planned war plans. The other planned war ha plan was the continuation of the first war against Iraq. We had aircraft flying over the north and flying over the south, northern and southern watch. We move, would move forces into Kuwait to defend Kuwait under a program called Intrinsic Action, send in Army and Marines. So um, Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis were actually under both air and sea blockade. And if you think back, you could remember this. Throughout the 90s, I mean, we dropped bombs on them routinely. We, we had cut off most of their oil. They did some shady stuff through the United Nations. Imagine that. But they did some shady stuff with them to try and get some money. But, but they were in bad shape. They weren't particularly... Uh, particularly good shape. But, but nevertheless, Saddam had been very vocal in supporting terrorists. He'd invited terrorists to come live there. Um, and if anybody in this room remembers, and again, looking around, I think some of you will, the 1985 uh, seizure of the Italian cruise ship Achille Lauro? Yes, okay, well, an American, Leon Klinghoffer, a guy in a wheelchair, they, they actually threw him over the side of the ship. The guy who did that attack, the guy who did that attack and his terrorist group were guests of Saddam Hussein. They were in there. So you'll hear people say things like, well, there was no terrorist group. You know, the Al-Qaeda wasn't there. You know, no, they were there. And they were guests of his. He, he invited them, much like Mullah Omar had invited Al-Qaeda in. And Al-Qaeda didn't start the war there, but they were there by the time we invaded in 03. Nevertheless, the problem is we got two great war plans, but the guys we need to go after are in which country? Afghanistan. Okay, so where's the war plan for Afghanistan? You know, crickets, nothing. We don't have a plan for them. We hadn't planned to do that. No American general or admiral in their right mind ever would go in Afghanistan. It's a landlocked country. It's got all kinds of issues, as we'll see. So Bush basically tells them, look, that's where they are. We got to go get them. So he says, make a plan for Afghanistan. Now, all we wanted to get was those 20 people in Al-Qaeda. But how do you get them? Well, we didn't. We didn't have the capability to get them. Today, now you'd say, oh, well, we sent out the drone and we got the, the big mother of all bombs. We got all, yeah, that's today, all right? 16 years ago, we didn't have the intelligence or the capability to manhunt like that. When we try to do manhunting, if any of you have read the book or seen the movie Black Hawk Down, that's the way it usually turned out. We'd send in our great special operations forces, but because the intel wasn't good, we get entangled in firefights and never get the guy we were looking for. If you remember, even in Panama, a country we'd been in for almost a, cent uh, a century, when we tried to get Manuel Noriega, we didn't get him when we went in there to get him. In fact, we only got him because he went and hung out at the Papal Nuncio, and the, the papal guy finally got tired of hosting him and kicked him out, and we <laughs> picked him up. So um, it's good. we're not going to be able to find al-Qaeda. So we say what? Our military says correctly, tells Bush, he says, 
We can't get Al Qaeda, but but we can get the Taliban. So if you think of the Taliban as the petri dish, this bacteria swimming, we'll blow up the petri dish, put us on that. So that's what we do. We did have some CIA guys in there, and uh, they have been in and out since the war with the Soviets. So they were providing us some knowledge, and they say, you know, there is a resistance group up here in the north called the Northern Alliance. We'll go in and deal with that. So. In 2001, on October 7th, less than a month after the 9-11 attacks, our forces went in. We didn't go in alone. We had the British, we had the Canadians, we had the French, you know, some of our allies. Now, we have some good allies, and they all try and everything like this, but don't kid yourself. 90% of the heavy lifting is always us, all right, always, and that's not going to change. So when we went in, we had to go in with an unconventional plan because we had no base plan. We had no forces in the region. It's landlocked, so you can't sail an aircraft carrier right up next to it or anything like that. So we got these Jamokes in the Northern Alliance. There they are, by the way, um, dragging away somebody from the Southern Alliance, you know, one of the Taliban guys. And, uh, and here they are. They, you know, they got all their machine guns. All sides there were armed with old Russian equipment that they'd taken from, the, from when Afghanistan was under Russian Soviet control. So they're the Northern Alliance. Now, they by themselves have been unable to defeat the Taliban, and they knew they couldn't defeat the Taliban, so they need help. So this is going to be our boots on the ground, and in an unconventional plan, we send in our air power. U.S. and NATO air power, that's B-52s that came all the way from Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. We sent in B-2 bombers from Whiteman Air Base. Our carriers out in the Gulf, the, um, out in the uh, Arabian Sea there, the, uh, the Kitty Hawk and others began to send in air power as well. Um, and then some of the NATO countries as well assisted that had that had air in the region. Now, these are great, and you can do a lot of damage with a B-52, but you got to know what to bomb. And to figure that out, I mean, you could ask these guys, but, you know, what do they know? So, and, and by the way, the adult illiteracy rate in Afghanistan is about 85%. So you would not want to, and, and with that goes innumeracy. So if you sort of ask them to give you the map position, Good luck. So we had to send in somebody to direct that air power. And the guys we sent in were the CIA and our special operations forces. There are some of them. Some of them came right here from this state, from Fort Bragg, people from Seymour Johnson, all that. There they are, a rough-looking crew, because they're going to blend in with these guys. They actually had to call in to get parachuted in saddles and stuff like that. And, uh, and so here he is. What's interesting, the Afghans were good horse guys. We, we had to learn it on the fly. Some, you know, that's not a skill we teach in the Army anymore. Um, <laughs> but, but we had to relearn it. And, uh, and um, the big thing that this guy had with him was his radio and, a, and a, a super version of this laser pointer that he could point on a target. And then this is my favorite picture of all. So we started bringing in the air power. And as the Taliban tried to fight the Northern Alliance, something had changed. The Americans now had the ability to bring in devastating airstrikes on the Taliban position. I like this particular picture because you can just see the Afghans, see these smoking craters up there on top of the hill. The, all the Afghan here is are like, dude, you know, they can't, believe, <laughs> they can't believe this. They've never seen anything like this. A very impressive display by the Americans. You know, we went in on October 7th. To, by two months later, December 7th, the Taliban had been run out, run out. The Al Qaeda was on the run. They were gone across the Pakistani border, and this thing looked to be over, which then caused us to turn to the other problem we had. The Iraqis were still there, and as I mentioned, we'd been fighting them continually since they invaded Kuwait in 1990, bombing them every day, our pilots flying over there at risk, getting shot at, and all that. So President Bush decides, hey, look, we're not going to wait till they do something. We're going in to get them. And so in March, March 19th of 2003, we went in after Saddam Hussein. This was the opening night uh, in Baghdad. And as a military guy, I will tell you, this is exactly what your pilots hope to see. The city's all lit up because they did not know we were coming. All right. So we caught them by surprise, tore them up, sent in there, destroyed all their remaining communications. Their, their air force was so gutless, they actually buried the planes <laughs> rather than face us. They had sent their fighters up in 91, but we'd shot every one of them down. And so that came up against us. In fact, in 91, about 100 of them actually flew to their mortal enemy, Iran, rather than fight us. So but this time, they just buried them out in the desert. They weren't even going to try to fight, so that kind of thing. Their army was, was easily brushed aside, smashed in a, in, a, in a short campaign. We started on March 19th. We, were, we had taken Baghdad by, uh, by March 9th. These are actually U.S. tanks going through the center of downtown Baghdad. Those cross swords were Saddam's... Uh, Salute to his military while well, he was run out of office. Pulled down his statue on March 9th with the help of the U.S. Marine Corps, who yanked it down. They used one of their big tank retrievers and pulled that statue down in East Baghdad and Alfredo Square. Now, we had a few things that kind of were like loose ends. 
We had a lot of Iraqi prisoners of war because they surrendered. They're pretty good at that. Their, their military was excellent at surrendering. And, and we gave them a lot of practice in the two wars we fought. So here they are. This is a British guy. So they surrendered to the British guys down south. These guys are all in uniform. Those we know what to do with. This was the group that was a surprise. A lot of people in civilian clothes came out with weapons shooting at us. We thought we were going to be greeted as liberators like entering occupied France. Not the case. In fact, we were treated instead as you know infidels, troublemakers, occupiers. And we immediately picked up a big group of these kind of guys. Some of these guys got rid of their uniforms and joined this group. And so right away, we could tell things weren't really done in Afghanistan. Things weren't really done in Iraq. We had inherited, although we didn't know it, the start of two insurgencies. So a little bit about both countries. Now, here's the part. This is the homework we probably should have done before we started dropping bombs and sending tanks into these countries. Um, this is Afghanistan, and I describe Afghanistan as a hole in the map. And why do I say that? Afghanistan for centuries was the place that all the countries around there finally gave up and said, they're too dang crazy, I'm not going in there, all right? <laughs> the Afghans are rough people. They live in the mountains, the Hindu Kush mountains. In Hindi, that means Hindu killer. So people from India knew if they came up here, they were not going to make it through those mountains. If the, if the terrain and weather didn't get them, the locals would get them. And down here is the reg I know on this map it looks nice and green and everything. That's actually a desert, the Registan Desert down here. So you could, if you're an Afghan, you either live in the desert or you live in the mountains. That makes for some very tough people. And the Afghan people, Afghanistan sometimes called the graveyard of empires. Every country you've ever heard of that was powerful tried to go in there sooner or later. Alexander the Great and the Macedonians tried to take it over. Didn't work. Genghis Khan and the Mongols tried to take it over. Didn't work. The, the Russian Tsarist Empire tried to take it over. Didn't work. The British Empire tried three different times to take it over. Didn't work. The Soviet Union, and those are guys, you know, they were not fighting by the Marcus of Queensbury rules at all. I mean, they went in there with poison gas, everything. Didn't work. All right? These are very, very tough people. Now, who are the Afghan people? Who lives in that hole in the map? These are the peoples of Afghanistan. There were 21 million of them in 01 when we went in. Today, there's 34 million. All right, so they, they, there's a lot of them, and there's more of them every year. Um, the plurality of Afghanistans are Pashtuns, these guys. They speak Pashto. Okay, so Mullah Omar was a Pashtun. That's the plurality. Now, 42% of the country is that particular group. Um, the Pashtuns are the principal members of the Taliban. So all the ethnic groups I'm going to show you, although all of them have a few guys in the Taliban, almost all the Taliban are Pashtuns. So if it was a Venn diagram, most of the Venn diagram would be sitting on the Pashtun part of the circle for the Taliban. There's also Tajiks to the north. These are generally pro-U.S. guys, Dari. This was the Northern Alliance. They're the second largest groups there. Dari is a dialect similar to the Persian Farsi. This guy and this guy can't not talk to each other unless they use each other's language. All right. The Afghan government has two official languages, but they always use this one even though the plurality of people are Pashto. When I asked the Afghan once, hey, how come we always speak Dari, even though most of the country's Pashto? They go, well, most of the country's Pashto, but that's the part in revolt. Why should we speak their language? Okay. <laughs> All right, the Hazara, who speak Dari, these guys are, are, are distinctly Asian people. The word Hazara in, uh, in Dari actually means thousand. The, the story goes that they were the remainder of the, of the, uh, the Mongol Tumen, the Mon Mongol force, that entered on, under Genghis Khan and occupied the center of the country. Almost all the Hazaras live near here, Bamiyan, in the center of the country. This is the place where the Taliban blew up those two Buddha statues. That was in the Hazara region. They, the Hazaras are not Buddhist. They're mo everybody I've showed you here is Muslim. But, uh, but they used to be Buddhist way, way back in the day. Um, there's Turkmen to the north and Turkmenistan, which is an old part of the Soviet Union. They're up here. Then Uzbekistan. So you also have Uzbeks. And then you have Tajiks, we've already mentioned them. And there's one more group, and here she is, Nuristani. The Nuristanis, 1% of the country is Nuristani. If you notice, she's a red-headed woman with uh, blue eyes. The rumor is that they are the descendants of the Greeks that, and the Macedonians that marched in with Alexander the Great. So they're Europeans. Uh, they speak their own language. They were the last peoples in Afghanistan to convert to Islam. They did not convert to Islam until almost 1880. All right. If you, any of you have ever seen or read the old Roger Kipling uh, short story novella, Man Who Would Be King, or seen the movie with uh, Michael Caine and Sean Connery, that's where it happens, Nuristan. That's what Kafiristan is in the movie, Nuristan. It was a pagan area until very late in the 19th century. Now, one thing I can tell you. So here's the people of Afghanistan. 
Left their own devices, all six of these groups will fight each other. That's what they like to do. And they'll fight within each other. All right, that's what they do. The only thing that'll bring them together is an outside group coming in. Then they'll put down their weapons for a minute, group together to fight the outsider. The other problem you can see is if you have an election in this country, which group's going to win the election? Really? Can you win an election with 42%? That's the problem. Every election in Afghanistan, go back and watch is what happened. Look at the election since 2001. Every one of them is a hung jury, and they all get resolved Chicago Cook County style. <laughs> Which is to say, whoever's the guy who wins, whether it was Karzai, now it's Ghani, they basically, you know, how many ballots do you need? And they bring them in, and then the Pashtun guy wins. But the Pashtun guy who wins is always not the Taliban guy. He's, he's the house Pashtun that belongs to the Americans. I mean, Ashraf Ghani, the current, Ashraf Ghani Avanzai, the current president of Afghanistan, speaks much better English than I do. He went to school at Columbia. He used to teach out at Berkeley. He used to work for the International Monetary Fund. The Afghans see this guy and they say, what? He's an American tool, all right? And all the other postures say, what? I'm going with the Taliban, okay? So you, you got a situation here where it's going to be very difficult to have a democracy. And the elections that they've had since 2001 are, are corrupt and laughable. Okay, then you get to Iraq. So you say, okay, well, that was bad. How about this other country? Yeah, it's bad too. Iraq, the actual nickname in Arabic means the, the escarpment or the divide, because it is the divide between the Sunni world, Saudi Arabia and uh, Jordan and stuff like that, and the majority of the Syrian population are Sunni, and Turkey, of course, and the Shia world, the Iranian Persians and the Shia Arabs who live in, in eastern Iraq, so the divide. Um, Iraq is split more along religious lines than ethnic lines. Most of the people in Iraq are Arabs, not all. In Iraq, had 27 million people when we went in in 03, and they got 39 today. By the way, one of the things I should tell you when you see these demographic numbers, did we kill all of them? No. Despite what you saw in the news media, no, we did not go in and slaughter all of them or anything like that. In fact, they seem to be re reproducing rather well. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of them are coming here. But um, the um, Sunni Arabs, had, who are Arabic speakers, of course, Sunni Arabs, the majority of, of Muslims in the world are Sunni. And, um, but that is a minority in Iraq. And about 17% of the population was Sunni. The Ottoman Turks, the British, and Saddam Hussein all put the Sunnis in charge, even though they were the minority. In both Iraq and Afghanistan, you can't have a census. You know how in the U.S. we have a census every 10 years? You can't have it in those countries because it's a political act and it turns into more reason for fighting. When I would talk to Sunnis in Iraq, they would tell me they thought they were the majority. And I'd say, but you only are like one-fifth of the population. they go, oh, no, no, we're the majority because we were always in charge. You know, that, you know, the only reason we're not in charge is because of you, you know. And, uh, and it's because of the numbers I'll show you here in a minute. The majority is actually the Shia Arabs, okay? They also speak Arabic. There's a Shia woman. Um, the Sunnis will tend to be more secular. Not all of them. Some of them are very religious. I mean, um, Osama bin Laden's a Sunni guy, the Wahhabi sect. But, um, but the secular guys, the guys you would see who uh, have nice cars and don't dress like this, you know, dress in regular suits like me or whatever, tend to be Sunnis. The Shia tend to be very traditional. So they're the ones where you'd see the women are all covered and all that kind of thing with the Shia. The Shia, are the, the Iraqis, the Sunnis call the Shia Shurugis. And that's, that means Easterners, but when they say it, they go like Shurugis and spit because the implication is sort of like rednecks, rubes, hicks, hayseeds, you know, basically... These were always the downtrodden people in society. They never got the good deals. They never got good education or anything. So, so when a, a Sunni looks at a Shia, they basically see somebody who's undereducated and incompetent and shouldn't be allowed to be in charge of anything. And then you have the Kurds. Now, the Kurdish guys, you notice blonde, red hair, blue eyes, they're European type people. They're not, they're not Arabs. They are Muslims, and they live in the north. The Kurdish peoples actually straddle you find them in Iraq, you find them in southern Turkey. The Turks hate to talk about Kurds. They call them mountain Turks. They don't even like to admit they exist. And then they're in eastern Syria. They're also in Iran. They're, they're a people who wants their own country. And, uh, and they, they are, uh, make about 20% of the population. They work with these other two groups, you know, reluctantly. Kurdistan right now in northern Iraq is, is you know, de facto, it's like a semi-independent country. And when you go to Kurdistan, it's unlike all the rest of Iraq. When you go up in Kurdistan... It's nice. It's peaceful. I mean, it, it looks like you're in Switzerland or something like that. It, you know, the people are, are going to the store. Nobody's shooting at each other. I mean, it's it's very nice. And the Kurds keep a big militia force, the Peshmerga, along what they call the Green Line, to keep all the Arabs out. And if the Arabs try to cross, they kill them. And that's how come per 
Kurdistan is very pleasant. Um, <laughs> the Turkmen. Well, I mean, talk about these, because these guys all want to fight, these Arabs that live down here. The Turkmen, the same Turkmen you'd find in Afghanistan or Turkmenistan or the old southern USSR, they're over here as well, primarily found around this area and, and a string of them that goes up the, um, the Tigris River there. The Yazidis, these are the, um, the locals will tell you they're devil worshippers. What they are is Zoroastrians. They're, they're left over from pre-Christianity, pre-Islam or anything, and they worship the same, the same deities that you would have seen the ancient Persian Empire worship. Uh, and one of the things they're interested in, when they were around, there was no oil industry. So they would, you know, they'd find fire burning on the ground in, in you know, pools of, of petroleum. And they thought that was a manifestation of, of their divine beings. So that's why they're sometimes called fire worshippers or devil worshippers. These guys have taken it really hard at the extent of ISIS. ISIS kills these people on site practically. And then the other group that's taken a beating is Christians. Um, again, always attacked. There were some Christians there. Um, believe it or not, the, um, until Saddam Hussein, Iraq also had a Jewish community. And you can see the remnants of it, but he ran most of them out. And, of course, in his time, Israel was only, and other countries were only too happy to take them for their own safety. But this Christian minority is still there. These two groups heavily suffered um, during the war. Uh, every party takes turns beating them up because uh, they're very small and they're not capable. Now, okay, so let's have an election in Iraq. Who's going to win? The Americans come in and say, no, we're going to have democracy, Jefferson, we're going to have an election. Which group is guaranteed to win every election? Not the Sunnis. The Shia. Oh, no, the Shrugis. The rednecks are going to win the election? These guys, I nullify, I hate that, you know. They want to put the hats on and march around. I mean, they really want to do that, but they also want to get their AK-47s out. You know, basically, these guys are disenfranchised. And, of course, if you're the Shia Arabs, because you got 60% of the votes, do you need any of the other groups? No. The Shia Arabs look to the big Shia state to their east as their big brother. That is Iran. The United States, and this is what Sunni Arabs used to tell me, you know, when we'd be sitting down, they'd be complaining about life, and they'd say, you know, thanks to you guys coming here, you've put the Persians in charge of our country because you insisted on having a vote. Now these guys voted, and they brought in their buddies from Tehran. If, if you're not aware of this now, when you look at the U.S. troop counts today in Iraq and stuff like that, be aware that there's about twice as many Iranian advisors and troops on the ground. Now, the Iranians don't have an air force worth anything, and they don't have, you know, they got a lot of bodies, but they don't have a lot of capability. But nevertheless, they are the guests of that, of that Iraqi government that's ruled by Shia. And we did that when we allowed them to have elections and put those guys in charge. This is another country that's not ready for democracy and doesn't want it. In fact, a little story about an election. So we're out, in, um, out near where you saw that video out near the city of Ramadi, and it's election day in 2005. The sheikh comes in, and the sheikh being a good sheikh, he's, a, he's a, a wealthy guy, he's got multiple goats and all this kind of stuff, and he's got a car, and he drives in in the car, and they drive in, and, and you know he and his four wives pile out, because according to Islam, if you can afford them, you can have up to four wives. And the sheikh says, I'd like to have five ballots, please. And, of course, the Iraqi guy running the thing, he goes, well, you only get one ballot to vote. He goes, no, no, I will vote for my wives. And he goes, no, no, the women have to vote. They're women. They can't vote. I, I got this. I'm, they, they work for me. I will do this. That's the kind of debate you have when you're trying to do democracy in countries like that. They don't get it. All right? And they're not going to get it. Okay, so back to who's the enemy, our old question. These two country profiles I showed you, when we stayed after the initial invasions, we inherited both of these messes. And now we're going to try and teach them how to be just like us. They're going to, be ju they're going to have capitalism. They're going to have democracy. They're going to have education. They're going to have rights for women. They're going to have gay rights. Going to, oh, you guys, just wait. You're going to love all this stuff. And so we're trying to impose this. Now, look, ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you this, speaking as a lifelong infantryman, social work at the barrel of a gun is not a winning formula. All right? So who's the enemy? We looked at who we thought the enemy was. So how many Taliban guys attacked us on 9-11? Zero, all right? And how many Iraqis attacked us on 9-11? Zero. And who have we been fighting? Oh, wait. Well, check it out. Here's who we've been fighting. So there was the original crew. Now ah, we finally got them. We finally got out and got most of them. There's the Taliban. They're still fighting in Afghanistan, as we'll see. They're still our enemy there, largely Pashtun group. Then you had Ba'athist Iraq, the remnants of that, still fighting us, okay? 
Then you had Iran, which hates Iraq and hates Afghanistan. They sit between the two of them. But, you know, the enemy, the enemy is my friend, so they will help out against the evil Americans. Then you got basically all those who support what's known as the honorable resistance. Now, where would you find the people in this big outer circle? Everywhere. 1.3 billion Muslims around the world. Now, not all Muslims are terrorists, but a lot of terrorists are Muslims. Okay? And some of them live in our country. Okay, and some of them live in France, and some of them live in, in any country that's accepted this particular group as immigrants. And so these people, the vast majority of them, listen, I'll tell you, and it's true in Iraq and Afghanistan, they don't want anything to do with terrorists, they don't want to do, but if there's 1.3 billion Muslims in the world and 10% of them are terrorists, how many people is that? Okay, let's do the math. 130 million, all right, the population of Japan, all right, and if it's 1%, it's still... 1.3 million. It's a lot of people, all right? So, you know, or 13 million, rather. So you're still dealing with a lot of people, all right? And that's the problem, this outer group. And I might add, we got a, this problem's compounded by another problem, and that's countries like these two. Is Pakistan and Saudi Arabia friend or enemy? You know, George Bush said, you're either with us or you're against us. These guys check both boxes, <laughs> all right? And so what do we do? We have to work with the Pakistanis because our forces are in a landlocked country. You know what our alternatives are to supply our forces in Afghanistan? We can go through Pakistan, tricky. We can go through Iran, forget it. We can go through the Russians. We actually use the Trans-Siberian Railroad and go through Putin's Russia. And then we go through Turkmenistan and all that to get our stuff in there. I mean, any day he wants, Vladimir Putin can shut off supplies to our forces in Afghanistan, can stop our planes flying in. All that. So when planes from Seymour Johnson go from here to go stage to fight in Afghanistan, they go through Russia. Yeah, yeah. That, that might explain to you, by the way, why we, get, you know, with the Russians, we get mad and we give them harsh looks and send them, you know, cut off their Christmas cards and stuff, but we don't really do much to them, all right? Because they got us by a chokehold there, all right? Hot Saudi Arabia, this country, I, I don't know what their gig is. I mean, you know, with fracking and everything, we don't need their oil anymore, but... Um, but we've got a, a, a relationship with them where, you know, we are basically the codependent spouse. And no matter how much they belt us around, we go, oh, you know, they didn't really mean it. You know. <laughs> no, they meant it. Okay. Our enemy, I've showed you how we like to fight. We like to fight with air power. We like to use our special operations forces. If we go in on the ground, we like to use overwhelming firepower. The way we're organized to fight is to knock you square in the head and take you out of it in about two weeks, a blitzkrieg. What's, what's our enemy like? Well, different kind of war for them, slow death. Here's the way our enemy prefers to fight. Rockets, long-range weapons, you know, basically bombard our camps and things like that. Explosive devices on the side of the road like we saw in the little video. They prefer to do this, death of a thousand cuts. In their view, as long as they're attacking the Americans every day, they don't have to gain any advantage. If you go back and you remember school about the American Revolution, uh, how many battles did, did Washington's Continental Army actually win against the British? Not very many. You know, Saratoga, yeah. Trenton, okay. Princeton, yeah. You know, the French, I'm embarrassed to admit, but the French are actually largely responsible for the victory at Yorktown. Their army under Rochambeau, their fleet under de Grasse, one of the few fleet engagements the Royal Navy ever lost, was right off Virginia Capes in September 1781. But the point I'm making is, our Minutemen, our Continentals, Daniel Morgan, all these other guys, you know, we talk about the battles they won at places like Guilford Courthouse, Calpens, but that's because we don't want to talk about the other 99 that they routinely got creamed. But the, you know what? The British might have won statistically, but like they say in the NFL, statistics are for losers. <laughs> Okay, so how do these guys fight? Their method is right here. And the guy who codified it was the greatest guerrilla leader in our history and the one who wrote down what he did, and that's Mao Zedong of the Chinese. This is Mao Zedong's little mantra. When he taught guerrillas, how do you fight a regular army chasing you? Enemy advances, we retreat. Enemy halts, we harass. Enemy tires, we attack. Enemy retreats, we pursue. These guys in Iraq and Afghanistan have never heard of Mao Zedong, but they know this method. They are good guerrilla fighters. This is the normal method of fighting in this part of the world. Lawrence of Arabia figured that out. We should have figured it out. But that's the enemy we fight. Let me show you the type of thing we're fighting, and you can tell me how do you drop a bomb on what I'm about to show you. How do you shoot a sniper round and take this out? 
So Americans, you know, when Americans come to a village in Iraq or Afghanistan, and we'll talk about, let's say, a village in Afghanistan, the people have been eating the same rice and dead goats for their whole life. And, you know, we want to help them. We want to improve their nutrition. And so we come in and say, Afghans, you know, your babies are getting sick. Your children are falling asleep in the school classes. You need some better nutrition. We're going to bring you some good American food. And, and the Afghans can't read. So they don't know that that says dole or tropical mixed fruit. So we tell the Afghans, they said, look, Afghan dude, you don't need to read yet. Just look. See what this is? They go, oh, it's fruit. Yeah, yeah, fruit. There you go. So open the can, eat the fruit. There you go. Now, of course, because it's Americans and because of federal regulations, the dole company cannot have a monopoly on this. So naturally, the Del Monte company insists, say, we also produce Rick's fruit, so you got to bring in some of ours, too. And it pop top lid, no problem at all. And again, the Afghan guy, he can't read Del Monte or cherry or mixed fruit or pull lid or anything. But what does he read? Oh, cherries, fruit, pears. Okay, that, look, that looks good. That's nice. <laughs> and then we say, and you need something for the children, too. Here's, here's the food for your babies. He can't read. What's in this? What does a Taliban guy come in at night and tell you? Guess what the Americans just gave you for your babies to eat? What? What's the picture? You see that, but what do they see? <laughs> Americans are feeding you dead babies. What? Well, we're not. No, we wouldn't do that. We're telling you. Are you guys infidels? Well, yeah, we're infidels. Well, you know, you know, basically, we're not from around there. How do you undo that? How do you tell them that's not true? Besides, you've, you've eaten this stuff. You can't be sure what it is. I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is, the, uh, the, Afghans, the Afghans or the Iraqis in the villagers confronted with that, they'll go with what the Taliban or the ISIS guy is telling them. And they'll say, the Americans told you, follow what the picture says. What's the picture? How do you bomb that? How do you shoot that? How do you stop that? That's a cultural disconnect that cannot be fixed by weapons. So, what does our side do? Well, we try to do what we're good at. We like to use air power and our artillery and our tanks and our ships and all that stuff whenever we can. Our joint direct attack munition, this bomb coming off this F-16, will go directly to the global positioning system coordinate. Now, now they say plus or minus 10 yards, but the good thing about a bomb, it's got about a 50-yard burst radius. So, you know, close is good enough with a JDAM. And, but, of course, you drop one of these, you know, how many times have you heard the following statement? Uh, we made a precision surgical strike. Okay. Yes, if you imagine doing surgery with a chainsaw. All right. <laughs> These are highly powerful weapons, and modern weapons are very, very dangerous. Even direct fire weapons. Like you'd say, okay, well, fine, I'll just shoot a sniper rifle. I'll just shoot an M4 carbine, an M16, uh, a 50 caliber machine gun. A 50 caliber machine gun goes like that bullet is a half inch, uh, inch and a half long. It goes like two miles, all right? And unlike on TV, I know I watch NCIS and stuff. You know, when Jethro shoots somebody, the guy falls over and there's a little dot on his chest, okay? Real life, you shoot those things, those bullets don't stop just because they went through something. A 50 caliber bullet will go through people, cars, houses, mud bricks, everything, and it's still going another two miles down the road, and it's going to hit all that. Why do I mention that? We bring a lot of firepower to war. The thought that somehow we're going to be precise and discriminate and careful, forget it. It's not designed to work that way. It's designed to work to be deadly, destructive, and horrible. All right? It's not for surgery. It's for killing people. Um, we even have uh, systems now with our computers where the thing will kill, you, kill it on your own. You don't even have to put a person up there. The drone will come off. You can actually fly these. The people actually sit in... in control rooms outside of Iraq and Afghanistan and fly these things and they'll they'll fly along and they'll shoot a Hellfire missile and take out targets. Tremendously capable. All right. Great, great systems. US firepower. What we have to use most often is guys like this. PFC Michael Strasbaugh, specialist Carlos Livingston, 2007, September, Bakuba, Iraq, two guys from first to the twelfth cavalry and the first cavalry division. Here they are. That's what we feel like we've got to do to figure out who the targets are. See, these bombs are great and the drones are big, but you've got to figure out which guy named Mohammed you need to kill this week. All right? The only way you can figure that out is put these guys on the ground. And they sort through the village and figure out which is the bad guy. And what do we know about them? I love the, these are the typical military stats, by the way, but this is my personal favorite. The base pay for a specialist or corporal in any of our services, $2,314.80. Come on, couldn't you just give them the extra 20 cents? But you know the green eye shade guy, no, there's no way. We, uh, we, uh, we need that money, you know. Okay, whatever. You know, but, uh, but there's the deal. Not, you know, basically paid minimum wage and out there doing the mission. 
This is the ethos of the U.S. Army, but I will tell you that all the services have this same ethos. You talk about what you can be proud about, about the men and women who fight on our behalf today. Right here is one thing. I will never leave a fallen comrade. This entire war has been fought by guys on foot out in villages, mountains, deserts. We do not have a single uniformed person missing in action. Not one. Every single one. And that, that is, I mean, that's something, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff about this war that I kick myself and I, I'm going to have to live with for the rest of my life. That's one I'm proud of, that I was part of a force that was like that. And that's something we can all be proud of as Americans. But I think the other thing, the last thing I'll say on that is um, we got to think about putting those people on the ground and what we're doing to them, putting them in this environment. So we fought a global war on terrorism. That was George Bush's name for the war, and it, it was continued. There were various other things tried. I think you heard them during the, the previous administration, the President Barack Obama administration. At one time, they talked about overseas contingencies. Another time, they talked about, you know, man caused disasters. I mean, they've tried all these different words. But the bottom line is this is what they keep call, calling it. Um, you know, terrorism is an enemy tactic. Part of this is because we have countries like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, and because we don't want to fight 1.3 billion Muslims, we never mention the M word or the I word that goes with it. But the reality is I have heard that some from the current president. So maybe we're going to start admitting who these guys ever want to kill us. Um, we put the majority of our forces into two countries, Iraq and Afghanistan. Here's the stats for Afghanistan. We had our combat forces there in force from 2001 to 2014. The numbers in blue were our troops. The numbers in black were allied and NATO troops. Afghanistan was a NATO war. NATO has a thing called Article 5, an attack on one is an attack on all. They invoked that for the first time in the history of NATO when September 11th happened. And there were actually NATO planes that came and flew here in support of our air patrols. And then they sent troops over there. And they've got troops over there. So that's Afghanistan. We did a surge in Afghanistan in 2010. We'll talk about surges in a minute. But a surge by its nature is temporary. You send in some extra troops. You sort of suppress things. The way I like to describe it, it's like if you got a fever and you say, you know, if one aspirin's good, I think I'll take eight. Okay, so you take eight and, um, and your fever goes down. But what happens after you go to the bathroom and all that stuff runs out? Fever goes back up. That's what a surge is. It's like the ocean coming in. Comes in, goes out. So there was a surge in Afghanistan in 10. This is what we got there today. 9,800 troops. This is a classic right here. So the military told the Obama administration, they said, I was involved in this, we said, hey, we're going to need around 10,000 troops with our Air Force Special Ops Advisor. We're going to need around 10,000. The 13-year-olds uh, the in the basement of the White House, all the graduates of Harvard, Yale, Georgetown, got together, and they said, oh, no, Mr. President, you need, to, you need to keep the military in line. So you cut them 200 troops just to show them who's boss. Okay, thanks, dude. Appreciate that. And, uh, and so they did do that. And so we, ha we have a troop cap of 9,800. You know what this causes? We have aviation units that are going over there right now, and they're not bringing their crew chiefs. Instead, they're hiring contractors, which don't count against that number. So you got our pilots going, and the guys fixing the aircraft, are you are paying them a million dollars a year to fix that aircraft. Okay, but, but by God, we're under 9,800. That's the key thing, you know. That's the kind of crap that's going on. Sadly, we've lost... Almost uh, 2,335 killed. I just posted these numbers today. And the numbers in black, this is the numbers lost from NATO and our allies. They have also suffered. Those do not include the Afghan numbers for friendly Afghan forces. Iraq started in 03. Again, blue numbers are us. People will tell you we had no allies in Iraq. Don't you believe them? There are plenty of allies there. Three of the divisions there were allied divisions. The British in the south with the Danes and others, the Australians, the, uh, the South Koreans in the north, and the Poles in the, in the center of the country. And the Poles in the center of the country, they basically had all the old Warsaw Pact countries that had gone into NATO. And, um, and for some reason, we put the people from El Salvador down there. I remember the Salvadoran guy coming up to me. He goes, well, we like serving with the Poles. The food is excellent and they're nice guys. But why did you put us with all the former communists? <laughs> you know, we were with you fighting on that side of the I, There wasn't much I could tell the guy. All right. Um, we did a surge in, Afghan in Iraq, a much bigger surge. And, of course, you can see here there were still uh, allied troops there. And then nowadays there's allies back for the fight against um, ISIS, only about 4,600 troops. We took more killed in Iraq. It was, it was more fighting. It's a, it's a more populous country and all that kind of stuff. These are statistics. And you look at all these, okay, stats, 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 stats. Every one of these is a person, a family, somebody we know, people I know, people you know, you know, to what end?
That's we got to ask ourselves. That's a lot of force we put on the ground. To what end? What did we accomplish? So, there we go. Here's the enemy forces in Afghanistan. If you look at their numbers, they start with 45,000. Look where they are today. 60,000. Good job. All right. Yeah, we got them down for a while. We took all the pills, you know, blah, 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 blah. The fever went down. But now the pills have run out and the fever's gone back up. And if you look at Iraq, since ISIS has come in, you know, we got them down pretty low too, but never down as low as these guys, never down to where they were. And down here and down here, and now they're down about 25,000. We've been bombing them pretty hard up there in northern Iraq and on the Syrian border. But nevertheless, they're there too. Remember Mount Setung. As the U.S. puts pressure on them, they back off. Remember our Minutemen, Daniel Morgan and the Rifleman, all that? You know, they get pressure from the regulars, they back off. Because why? What are we going to do in a year or two? Leave. Leave. Yeah, you short attention span theater. That's the Americans, you know. We, we don't make a long-term commitment to these wars. We're going to come in. All they know, they just got to wait till the next election cycle. They know when our elections are, and they realize all we need is a little change, and the next person will come in and leave. So then the question becomes, what options do we really have? Well, ladies and gentlemen, at your behest, your elected officials... And people like me, who are senior officers in the military and appointed officials uh, who are civilians, came up with various options. Meanwhile, while all this was being done, while we were going through garbage piles looking for hand grenades and all that kind of stuff, what were our enemies around the world doing? If they were the Iranians, they were working on their own nuclear weapons. There's Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. This guy would not know an, an atom from um, an apple. But, uh, but he's got some people there who might. All right. And of course, here's one of their missiles. Most of this stuff, technology wise, is pretty crude, but you know, it only has to partially work once if they drop it on Tel Aviv or on our forces in the Middle East. Um, then, of course, you got the Chinese. The Chinese have enjoyed the global war on terrorism. They think it's going swell. All right. Because the more time we spend there, the more time they spend expanding their influences in the South China Sea. Places like Woody Island, that used to be just sort of an atoll, now have very nice long runway. That's not for tourism. All right. And, you know, because most tourist sites don't need, you know, fuel and ammunition bunkers and, things, and submarine pens. Um, this is the Liaoning, their aircraft carrier that's now active in the South China Sea. They bought that from the Russians, who were only too happy to sell it for them for hard cash. And, uh, and there they go. And, of course, then there are the Russians. This guy, the little green men that, that, uh, that they have sent. The Rus the, you know, Putin's Russia has taken back the Crimea. It's taken back about a third of Ukraine. It daily menaces Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, all our allies over there. And, of course, there's our man. And like it says there, I voted, you know. Uh, the, you know, a lot of talk about Russian influence on the election. And, and people argue, depending on where, which T-shirt they're wearing, red or blue, oh, the Russians did this, the Russians did that. You know, I've had students say to me, you know, well, the Russians influenced the election because they wanted Trump to win. And then I've had other students say, no, the Russians influenced the election because they wanted Clinton to win. And I tell you, hey. If Putin's influencing the election, there's only one guy he's interested in. That would be Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. All right. He's doing it to disrupt our country and cause trouble and cause lack of trust and give him free time to continue his conquest of the Ukraine. All that was going on for the last 16 years while we were busy looking for, through trash piles and trying to convince the Afghans that they weren't eating their babies. Okay, so options. What options were presented to our leadership uh, during this war? I will tell you there's basically three, and we go back and forth and back and forth to these three options. When I tell you them, you're going to say, I've heard of these, because you hear them a lot. It's the only three we can seem to come up with. The first is what I call the Go Long Plan, and this is mostly affiliated. Here's some guys during the Iraq War, General Abizade, who actually, and General Casey, he was the commander in Iraq. He was the central command commander for all the Middle East. Robert Gates, Secretary of Defense. These guys um, had both served in the Middle East, both Gates and uh, both uh, Gates had. He'd been the CIA director, but uh, Casey had served in the Middle East with the U.N. Uh, Abizade had served multiple times in the Middle East. He was in northern Iraq at the end of the war uh, against Saddam. And General John Abizade is a Lebanese American. He speaks fluent Arabic. OK, so, I mean, pretty smart guys. The plan they had and this is uh, I would tell you the go long plan is the basic plan of the American senior military. If you grab the average person like me and say, what's your plan? This is the plan we'll give you. Now, I personally don't like this plan, but and I didn't while I was in, and, but, but I was a minority voice among the senior military. Most of the senior military likes this plan. And essentially what it is, the Joint Chiefs of Staff liked it, all of them liked it, 
Basically, it says, what you got here is the Cold War. So you need to turn things over to the locals to defend themselves. The U.S. will supply, supply air power and advisors and intelligence and logistics. And what the best thing would be to have a formal long-term U.S. commitment, just like the treaty we have with South Korea or the treaty we have with Thailand or the treaty we have with Australia and New Zealand or the NATO treaty. That's what these guys would want. And basically, you just accept that this war is going to go on for five or six decades, just like the Cold War. You know, plinking and planking, back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. Now, in the Cold War, did we ever really try to win? I mean, we did win. We got sort of an excuse me win at the end when our enemy collapsed. But, I mean, did we really seriously try to win? No, we said, well, oh, it's a, you can't fight it. It's got nukes and so very bad. Okay, yeah, nukes are very bad. And it would have been a bad thing if the Cuban Missile Crisis went hot or something. But... We did, we did pursue some strategies that definitely weakened the Soviets, particularly during the Reagan administration. So these guys are sort of saying, hey, go long, and sooner or later we'll think up a winning strategy. But right now our only strategy is, you know, continue to go. Just, you know, try and limit the, the pain. These guys did not want to put extra troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. In fact, Casey, as the commander, was the guy who first proposed starting to pull our troops out over there and turning it over to the Iraqis as incompetent as they can be. Um, another option. If that first one's sort of the standard senior military option, this next option, I would argue, this is the standard politician option, which is what? Hey, another election. Let's pull a chain on this thing. We're out of here. Now, you may think to yourself, you say, oh, yes, but that was, that was the Obama administration wanted to pull it. Oh, really? Bush administration also wanted to get out. They definitely wanted out by 08. By 06 to 08, they were trying to pull out. Obama administration trying to pull out. The guy who just won the election, what was Trump's policy? What did he say? No more stupid wars in the Middle East. Yeah, right before he bombed Syria and, you know, okay. But, but the point is, the politicians want this solution. And in fact, there was a panel, if you ever want to read it, it's very interesting, the Iraq Study Group. This, here's all the faces, you know, you've heard about the establishment. Here they are, all right, all these guys. The old defense secretaries like William Perry, you know, former senator, former Supreme Court justice, secretaries of defense, Rudy Giuliani, former mayor of New York, all that kind of stuff. The establishment got together and told Bush in the middle of the war, they said, hey, in Iraq, here's, we recommend we go home. Here's Bush when he got the report. You can look at the body language. What? <laughs> this, this is what you're telling me? I don't like this answer. Okay, but this is the answer. This, by the way, if you poll the American people, this is their option. So if I did a poll right here, now some you all are pretty informed. You raise your hand. A lot of military, a lot of families of military. You might see it a little more strategically. But if you poll Jane and Joe Six Pack in America, this is their preferred option. Get the hell out of there. We've had enough. These people don't appreciate us. Let's leave. That's what they say. And these guys said the war is a stalemate. The locals have not stepped up for all the reasons we talked about. The American people are divided. This war is tearing them apart. Pull our forces out now. This Iraq study group, because a couple of these guys, Chuck Robb and Ed Meese, were, were people who'd been around during Vietnam. Chuck Robb had actually fought in Vietnam as a Marine Rifle Company commander. They said, you know, you may need to send some extra troops in just so we can get our guys out. This is the origin of the surge idea, which is the third option. So you've heard of this option, the surge. This is the one that it was done in both Iraq and Afghanistan. So who's the father of the surge? The father of the surge is this guy, Jack Keane, General Jack Keane. Anybody seen him on Fox News? Oh, yeah, yeah. General Jack Keane was my commander multiple times. I know him very, very well. What you see is what you get with Jack Keane, all right? You're, there's no political correctness in this man, zero, all right? Um, it's kind of sad, really. He got out in 03. I, I, I prayed, I wished he would have stayed in because he, he would have he got his finger in, in the face of President Bush and others, and told him the real deal. General Keene fought in Vietnam at the 101st Airborne as a young guy. And, uh, and he learned there that counterinsurgency is very, very difficult. And he basically said, look, if you want to win this thing, you've got to go in really hard and really fast and bring in forces and clean this thing up. You, I mean, I hear him say it on Fox like every day when I tune in. He still says the same thing. But he believes that. This is his honest view. Now, I will tell you, there's some flaws with the surge that we'll talk about here. So, But this is what Keene said. And he's the real deal, by the way. Um, I've been out on patrol with him in Iraq and Afghanistan many times. I mean, when he goes out, you see all the soldiers are wearing all this body armor, helmets. Look at Keene. No, he's wearing a windbreaker. All right? He's not, I mean, I, he's a big target, too. I don't, he's the luckiest man in the world. I don't know how he does it. I mean, maybe, maybe he has protection. I don't know. But uh, 
But he's a he would go out on missions. I mean, you, you'd have to really watch General Keene. I mean, if you if you weren't careful, he'd be shooting himself out of a torpedo tube with the seals or something. I mean, he, but but when he makes these statements, he's not just making them from an armchair in Fox Studios in New York. He goes over there and checks things out on the ground. He has re- arrangements with old dudes he knows like me who are his former subordinates, and we do all that. So he had the idea of the surge, and he said, look, you need to get a better commander. He recommended this guy, David Petraeus. Now, David Petraeus was a protege of, of, of Jack Keene. He'd known him like his whole life. They'd always worked together. Petraeus is a different kind of animal than General Keene. He's a political general in a lot of ways. Um, he's a very ambitious man. Petraeus wanted to be president. He's not going to be president because of some personal infidelities. But, uh, but um, he wanted to be president. He was sitting out at the staff college in, uh, in Leavenworth, Kansas. He was on the shelf. The other generals were going to get him out of the army. They had no future for him. Keene goes in and tells Bush, says, hey, all your senior leaders are telling you do the long war. I'm telling you, go in with a big foot. Here's the guy who will do it. He's the most ambitious SOB in the Army. You give it to him. He wants your job. He's going to do the best he can. He's not going to leave anything in the locker room. And that's a fact. So what was the plan? Send in a lot more U.S. troops. We will do it ourselves. So get out of the way, Iraqi and Afghan military and police. We'll do it for you. You're too incompetent. We'll just run your country and do all that. And it's going to be over in 18 months. This was the one part that didn't work. You know, because here's the reality. Back to our enemy. So what do they do? So these surges were tried. And the surge was tried. So I would tell you the surge was also part of the same old, same old. So you got Bush did a surge in Iraq in 07, 09. And, you know, 18 months later, We withdrew most of our combat forces from Iraq. By the way, everybody blames Obama for this. The agreement to withdraw from Iraq was signed by Ambassador Ryan Crocker, our ambassador in Iraq, on behalf of President Bush in November of 2008, after the election results were known. And the title of the agreement was the Agreement on Withdrawal of U.S. Forces from Iraq. Okay? That was the agreement that was signed. Poor Ryan Crocker, who's a great guy, he was also our ambassador in Afghanistan, signed the same deal there. When this guy's surge ran out. And so, so poor Crocker has his name on the bottom of both of those. And, uh, but those were the agreements to leave. And what did our enemy do? So, same old, same old. And Americans advance, surge, we pull back. Americans pull out, we fill the gap. And the gap is now being filled by ISIS. And I might add that ISIS is also active in Afghanistan, if you don't know. That's, that's who we dropped that big Moab on, that big GBU-43. So the bottom line is the surge... The surge gives temporary relief. It made both of these guys feel good, like they'd done something very aggressive and and terrific. But much as I love General Keene, it's also not a winning strategy. It's a short-term strategy. And moreover, it burns up a lot of U.S. troops. We lose more people. And at the end of it, right here. They're right back because they live there. So the Israeli Defense Force, which has been living with this environment since 1948 when the modern state of Israel was founded, they, for a lot of reasons, their own and international, and some of it is moral, they cannot kill all the people who want to kill them. They'd like to. They, they would sure want to, but, but for moral reasons, they will not. And because they, they went through the Holocaust, they definitely will not. So the Israelis call it mowing the lawn. That's what they say. They say, when you've got terrorists that you're fighting, what you've got to do is kill their leaders and kill enough of them to keep them from killing you. So here's our forces. In, there they are, our boots on the ground in Afghanistan. They're, now, look, I'll tell you right now. This, this character here, do not carry a rifle with your trigger finger down here, all right? That's, that's our guy. That's Mustafa out on patrol in Afghanistan. And if you think he's mixed up, you know, we, we use large weapons and stuff like that. Why? Because he's not really good at finding the enemy. So we just use bigger and bigger stuff. We'll do it for him with our bombs. And here's our guy. Look at this guy. Where did he get that thing? You know, he probably ordered that off the back pages of the U.S. cab store or something like that, Ranger Joe's. But, uh, but yeah, here's all these guys. And notice it's take your children to work day in the Iraqi army. So, uh, so there you go. Those are the guys who are, are busy hunting down ISIS in Mosul right now. And, again, what's the solution? More U.S. firepower. So off the USS Ross and Porter the other night, 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles to hit that Syrian air base where they launched the chemical strike from. Um, that's what the Israelis call mowing the lawn. And that's what you do. And I would tell you, you can mow the lawn and mow the lawn and mow the lawn. Israel doesn't have a choice. They live in that bad neighborhood. They have to. We do not live in that bad neighborhood. The only numbers that really matter in this war on terrorism are these numbers, what Abraham Lincoln called the terrible arithmetic. 
Every American we lose, their family is starting to ask, what is this all about? And I don't have a good answer for them. I really don't, as, as I've shown you tonight. Now, are there other options? Well, yes, there are. Okay. Here's an option that was discussed in the last election. And the guy who won the election, Donald J. Trump, said that this was his policy. He didn't want to get involved in Mideast Wars. He said, what we need to do is take care of America first. We need to go secure. We can do this. Basically, this is what Israel does. We would use extensive intelligence, border enforcement, and law enforcement, and go after them. Look, our average police today, police here in, in Chapel Hill, police in Raleigh, police in, in Washington, D.C., federal services like the FBI and the Border Patrol, they know who the bad actors are. On the afternoon of September 11th, we had an FBI special agent that reported to us in the command I was at. We were responsible for the ground and sea defense of the United States. I'd never seen this guy in my life. And he comes in, he says, I'm here to help you. He's an FBI special agent. I said, well, what are you guys doing? He says, oh, we've rounded up 987, um, you know, suspect uh, enemy aliens. I'm like, well, what about their rights? He goes, they're not American citizens. They don't have any rights. You know, I mean, where did that idea go? But the, but the fact of the matter is, you know, this this would work if we would have the guts to do it. Yeah. This would absolutely work. You wouldn't, and and we'd have a lot less Americans killed. This this system could work. The problem here is, do we have the political will? And and this is going to take a lot of work. I mean, I know I know the current administration says they're committed to it, but you know, every day I see a little more of the moonwalk away from it. You know, so we'll just have to see. I know this is what a lot of Americans voted for in November. And because they're tired of this. They don't want to keep sending our men and women overseas. Here's the other option. This one's one that I can say is old military guy, 35 years service, four years in combat. We do have the option of bringing out the really big hammer. And, and no joking around. Quit goofing off. And we have done this in the past. This state's well aware of this gentleman. William Tecumseh Sherman. Burned most of uh, South Georgia. Burned most of South Carolina. Was burning his way through North Carolina when Joe Johnson and the Confederates surrendered right down the road here at Bennett Place, all right? Sherman's attitude, when, when somebody asked, he said, how can you do this? You're killing civilians. You're, you're destroying a country. He said, what? He said, war is hell, not a square dance. And, uh, and that's one attitude, and we've had that attitude at times. Another guy who believed this was Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay, and you know, people think of Curtis LeMay, the bad bomber general. Curtis LeMay was a guy like Sherman, and Sherman, by the way, had been wounded in the Civil War. He was always up front with his soldiers. He was not sitting in a headquarters sticking pins in a map. Curtis LeMay used to fly the missions over Germany and Japan. And he finally had to stop flying missions over Japan when they told him about the atomic bomb because he, he, they were afraid to get captured. Although LeMay told him, he said, the Japanese will never get anything out of me. And they should have believed him because they wouldn't have. But uh, LeMay's comment, you know, the firebombing of Tokyo, this is not an atomic attack. This was a firebombing of Tokyo, May 9th and 10th. LeMay stripped down the B-29s, loaded them up with incendiary bombs, sent them in at about 8,000 feet. The bombers went in so low that the bottom of the planes were singed by the, by the, you know, they came back, they were silver planes, they came back brown. There were little things on it too, and we don't know what that was, you know. The, the experts tried to tell the crews it was paper, but who knows. Um, but LeMay's comment, he says, I'll tell you, war is very simple. I'll tell you what war is about. War is about killing people. When you kill enough of them, they quit. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we could, if we wanted, I've told you already who the enemy groups are. If we wanted to go in, we know the Sunni Arabs are the enemy group in Iraq. If we go in there and started killing Sunni Arabs on this scale, believe me, this war would be over real quick. But the question is, it's sort of like defending our borders. Do we have the guts for that? Do we have the guts for that? And I'll leave you with a thought from a guy who did have the guts for it, and I'll tell you a little story about him. This fellow here is Colonel Mike Steele. If you've ever seen the movie Black Hawk Down, um, he was the Ranger Company commander in that movie, Black Hawk Down. He's actually played by a little guy named Jason Isaacs in the movie, a little English guy, which is totally wrong because Steele was a football player. He played on Vince Dooley's University of Georgia 1980 national champion team. All right, He's a big dude. All right, And, uh, and, and he lost part of his hand in that, in that battle. He was wounded there, decorated for valor. Mike Steele was a brigade commander, 3rd Brigade Combat Team, 101st Airborne Division in Iraq in 2006. Mike Steele and his guys pacified their area. By the time he left, there was no enemy activity in Saladin province because he hunted down and killed all of them. Now, here's what happened. They were aggressive, and some of his guys got a little overaggressive. 
And four of his soldiers were brought up on court-martial charges for killing prisoners who were unarmed. And they, in fact, did kill three unarmed Iraqis whose hands were bound and whose faces were covered. They killed them in cold blood. And, uh, and they committed that. Now, Steele had never told them to do that. But it's interesting because when those men, met, men went to court-martial, they said, well, our commander set such an aggressive attitude. He said, go after the enemy so hard, we felt we were allowed to do this. And so Steele was reprimanded. Now, I might add, in 1943 on the island of Sicily, two soldiers from the 45th Infantry Division were court-martialed for killing Italian prisoners. And in the court-martial, they blamed their army commander, Lieutenant General George S. Patton, Jr., and said, he gave us blood and thunder speeches, and therefore we felt like we had to kill the prisoners. That court-martial in 1943 convicted the two guys and threw out the comments about Patton. What happened to Steele? Well, Steele was reprimanded by the senior U.S. leadership in Iraq, and he retired as a colonel. Here's what Mike Steele says about going into these countries. I've been in more third world countries than anybody in this room. I'll tell you, most of them do not speak English. They all speak food chain. From the time you set foot in their country, they're checking you out from top to bottom. They figured out where you are on the food chain. Because if you look like prey, what happens? You get eaten. If you stand there and look people in the eye, you have your weapon at ready and you don't flinch, you look like you're not scared. Even if you are scared, you look like you're not scared. Very Patton-esque there. You send the message, I am the dominant predator on the street. If you mess with me, I will eat you. Now, you know what? The ladies and gentlemen in this room, some of you may be offended by that or whatever, and I would tell you, get over it. If we are serious about winning this war, this has got to be the order. All right. Thank you for a brilliant presentation. In terms of the American voice, uh, which would be getting out of the Middle East, protecting Israel, uh, does energy play a critical role? Presuming it does, if we developed our natural gas and fuel, what would be the effect possibly adverse to Saudi Arabia? How much would that short the sheets of their bed? Well, uh, it, it, it's a great question. Saudi, the Saudi kingdom, of course, is founded on oil. I mean, they really have nothing else. They, they do have a, a significant tourist industry because of Mecca and Medina, the two Islamic holy sites. But, but that's like 10% of their economy. Most of it is oil. Um, of course, it, it, would, it would hurt them. As we develop our sources, it will hurt them. But we'll also reduce our dependency on them, you know, because right now we, we allow a lot of bad behavior from them and their, and their buddies that, uh, that we wouldn't want. It's important to remember, though, that, that among the top four oil producers in the world every year is also Russia. And uh, one of the surest ways to take money out of the hands of Vladimir Putin is to continue to develop our sources of, of oil and, and petroleum. Um, that, would, that would absolutely help. But I, but I think all those are things, you know, you don't want to give countries like those two countries that we just mentioned, you don't want to give them leverage over us. And, and we've, we've been too easy to give leverage. During the Cold War, you could probably make the argument, particularly after Iran went radical, that we needed the Saudis to help us keep control of the Persian Gulf. And, and the other thing I should mention, our allies in Europe, Japan, and China, who's no ally, but, I mean, they needed to. But all those other countries do depend heavily on Saudi and, um, and oil from the Emirates and things like that, Kuwait. Thank you again. It was a great presentation. Uh, I have a question. Uh, when I look at the uh, Gulf World of Two, I can't help but not think of Gulf World, uh, Gulf World One. And what stands out in my mind, when Saddam went into Kuwait, Saudi Arabia and not one of the Arab states did anything to protect their neighbor. It took 450,000 Americans to go over there, which was twice as many people than George Bush sent to Iraq. That's a telling sign. Secondly, when they tried to provoke us by launching missiles into Israel, we requested Israel do nothing. What that is telling us, there's a whole dynamic here we have to consider. We're letting the enemies of the West dictate our rules of engagement. If we continue to think we can go it alone, uh, it has to be the Arab states. There's 350 million Arabs in that nation. If they can't control their own area, I, I I don't know if we should be there. Yeah, I mean, great comments. Um, 
there are there are moderate Arab states. I mean, Jor the Kingdom of Jordan is a classic example. You know, King Abdullah in Jordan and his sister, who's a, a major general in the Jordanian army, are both graduates of Sandhurst, the Royal Military Academy in Great Britain. Uh, that's a country that's trying very much to be in the modern world. Jordan doesn't have any oil to speak of. I mean, they have a little, but they don't have any oil. And and but yet sometimes their voice is not heard. And I will tell you, Jordanian troops have been in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and they fought effectively. Um, they work with us, the British, the Canadian, you know, and they try to be competent. Um, sometimes we don't do what we should for some of these modern countries. I mean, look at how, how poorly we treated um, the Egyptians during the Arab Spring. I mean, look, you and I may argue whether Hosni Mubarak, uh, these parts of the world, you don't have democratically elected leaders. There's one democracy in the Middle East, which is Israel, okay? These other countries are not democracies, but they don't want to be. And we were so quick to let people throw Mubarak out, and then you get the Muslim Brotherhood in there, and, you know, we're trying to make nice with them. Uh, General al-Sisi, who's the current guy, I mean, we would call him a military or authoritarian dictator, but there's no doubt that he's trying to move Egypt in the right direction. I mean, he has condemned a lot of this terrorist activity and stuff. It, it, we have to, as you rightly said, we have to find local people there and empower them. The country of Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world, and they have taken drastic steps against um, radicals in their country. Um, the problem is, what do they get from Americans? By and large, they get nasty emails from us complaining about their human rights violations. All right? You know, the Indonesians would turn to you and say, look, I don't consider it a human rights violation when the person who I've just arrested and, and uh, beat up here was going to saw my wife's head off if, you know, I didn't do this. They say we're in drastic situation with, with insurgencies going. But, yeah, we, we need to do a lot more to reinforce the, the moderate Muslim countries. Ladies and gentlemen, I mean, uh, you know, we've said a bunch of things tonight. I have, too. But remember, the majority of the victims of this kind of activity are, are Muslim people in that region. I mean, and they hate it. I mean, the most of the people I knew in Afghanistan and Iraq, the average person, they hated it. You know, if they truly had democracy, if you could somehow work through the layer of, of knuckleheads they have in their country, although sometimes we say that here, too. But uh, if you could do that... Um, the average person there very much wants pretty much what we want in terms of they want to raise their family, send their children to school, that kind of thing. I can't tell you the number of Iraqis and Afghans I had that told me, you know, they said, oh, yes, well, according to the law, they, you know, I have only daughters. And they say my daughters can't join the military. They can't, do, you know, I want them to have an opportunity. In your country, your daughters could do this. Why can't mine? You know, and, and there wasn't much I could say to them, you know. Uh, but but those kind of moderate views we need to encourage whenever we can. And we have moral authority in that area if we'll, if we'll exercise it. But we cannot be, we cannot be wishy-washy. I mean, we can't when we, I mean, God, the, the previous president of Afghanistan, one day on International Women's Day, March 8th in 2012, he comes out in his public announcement, he says, I am making an announcement, this is Hamid Karzai, I'm making an announcement for Women's Day. I say, no, men only beat your wives lightly when they get out of hand. <laughs> you know, and we, and that was our guy. You know, so I mean, you know, who's wearing that stink? It's, you know, that the people there know we know better, you know? Thank you. Yeah. General, thank you very much. Um, it's also important in this uh, conflict to understand our enemy. And I know we refer to the moderate Muslims and the rest. But understanding Islam is that it doesn't matter if they're uh, radicalized or if they're a moderate. They all have the same goal. And that's to turn Dar al-Harb, the world right. war, the Dar al-Islam, the world that is submitted. And... Whether they're the tip of the spear, the 10% that are the war fighters, or the 90% that are not, one of the five pillars of Islam is charity. And charity only counts if it goes to a Muslim charity. That's one reason, you know, the question asked a minute ago why we had to go and save their countries, because their charity is going toward the Islamic Jihad, not towards each other. So, and we've already proven, but 95% of the ones we know for Muslim charities support terrorism. So there is a worldwide jihad that goes on that is supported by the warfighters and the moderates. So understanding the enemy that we face is going to be the, 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 the key to, to fixing this problem. But as you pointed out with, uh, with Israel, you know, Israel is fighting an insurgency or fighting a war very much like we fought after World War II. We sometimes forget that we're not, this isn't, this isn't our first insurgency. There was, there was an insurgency of Nazis in, in, in Germany after World War II. And the way you fight an insurgency is who wants to fight? Man stands up, bang. You do that enough times, they lose their enemies, the insurgency's over. So either we fight, and we take the fight to the enemy and say, you want to fight us? You die. Or we come home. Because we lost the war, but we didn't declare victory. If you understand Islam, again, understanding our enemy, Allah Akbar, our God is greater. The way it is spread is that if we can beat you up, obviously Allah is greater than you. 
and you must convert to our religion. That's the way the, the, the religion has been spread. They cannot accept defeat by holy writ. The war was lost when we did not declare victory for what we did over there. And we allowed them to set, uh, set up Islam as the, the state religion of, of, of Iraq. At that point, bring the boys home. We lost. Yeah, well, I might add that the official name of the country of Afghanistan is the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. So, I mean, you know, again, this is that's all on us. I mean, I had I had Iraqis and Afghans both turn to me and go, why, you know, you guys have had a great constant. Why did you let us write our own? Con we don't know anything about this. Why didn't you just do it? We saw what you did in Japan. We saw what you did in Germany after World War Two. You know, please occupy us, but be serious about it. You know, that's that was their argument. Remember, Jerry. Well, I have a suggestion. I'm sorry, I do have a suggestion. So, you know, Jefferson had a copy of the Quran to understand his enemy and he formed the Marines to fight. So combine two of your things up there with a the surge, do a surge, declare victory, and then come home. I'm, and that will, rub it, that. that will win the war. No, I'd be good. I mean, and I would tell you, we missed our opportunities in 01 in Afghanistan and 03 in Iraq. We should have done that. I mean, what you're going to do over there at best is a punitive operation. You drop a big bomb on them or, you know, or do an invasion, but you're not going to remake their countries for the reason you described. They, you're right. It's very, very difficult. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, sir. General, I want to uh, thank you for your service. I was in submarines during the Cold War, and it never got quite as personal as it does on the ground in these countries, and I, I can't tell you how much I admire people who are willing to do that. Um, on two slides, you hit the nail on the head as far as my concerns. One was your Venn diagram and the large circle around it. That's our enemy, and the enemy's inside the gate. And the other one is the demographics. They have increased their population by 50% in 15 years. What's going to happen to the ones we've let into our country 50 years from now? I've got 21 grandkids. And I'm not even, we're not even keeping pace with those guys. My, my grandkids, seriously, there's no way my grandkids are going to be able to democratically solve this problem if they're outvoted by people who, who do not swear allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. Right. We have swallowed the poison pill. We need to take the antidote real quick or we're not going to make it. Yeah, I, I will tell you, and I think you're all aware of this, that although the United States has admitted, you know, quote unquote, refugees, immigrants, whatever you want to call it from these areas, We've, we have accepted a much lower number than some of our European allies. Um, what you're seeing go on now in Germany, France, Italy is significant. Um, uh, they're, they're one election cycle away in places like France from open civil war. I think, I think they're finished. They're yeah. demographically finished. Yeah, I, I think you're, uh, sadly, I think you may be right. I would tell you for us, um, again, we, we do things in the United States by rule of law and elections. The last election, this was an issue. Um, we'll see what the will is of the American people through our elected representatives to actually impose some of those We've things. already seen it. We've seen three minor judges stop the immigration reform in its Well, past. and that'll be the question. Are we done or not? I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not done. I kind of like the way Jackson operated. He said he's made his decision. Let yeah, him let him enforce, enforce it. it. Well, let's, let's wait and see what, what actually happens. I will tell you one thing that's going on now. Don't kid yourself on this. John Kelly, the Marine general who heads Homeland Security, you know, his son was killed in Iraq, and uh, he fought in Iraq. Um, there's a lot of things that aren't being discussed that are being done every day. It's sort of like that FBI special agent who showed up on the afternoon of 9-11. A lot of that is going on right now, and, and uh, it's not being done where a judge can do anything about it. Um, you know, we have all benefited or suffered from the uh, power of executive agencies in the United States. Well, that can also be turned towards some of these policies, and it is my belief that some of that is going on at HS, and we're just not seeing it. Well, we're, we're at less than 1% Muslim right now. That is correct. And uh, England is at about 5%, but London is 55%. Right, yeah, particularly the east side. Uh, th that, yeah, that's I mean, how fast it goes, and that's how little it takes. Right. We're, we're only two generations away from being over. Well, I, I always laugh that, you know, on PBS, when they have that show every Sunday night, East Enders, it, it actually should be done in... in uh, in Urdu, because that's who's in fact in East Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a great lecture. Let's see if we can't get everyone's questions in. All right. Thank you all for moving along. The, in the second half of 2009, Barack Obama took about a month or two to reevaluate our policy in uh, Afghanistan. Yes. 
And I said to my wife at that time, we should just pull out everything because it's not worth losing another soldier or having another one wounded. It's like a moon rock. It has no value to us. And then, why do you th and then about two months later, he continued the war, and we're still there today. Why do you think he made that decision to continue the war? And the only thing I can even guess at is that he, wa he hadn't got bin Laden at that time, and he wanted to use Afghanistan as a base for that. Um, it could be that. Uh, I, I was around when that was all going on, and I, I had a minor role in it, so I do know something about it. Um, the... Um, the pre President Obama actually ran on a platform that he was going to pull everybody out of both countries within 18 months. And that, that was what he ran on. Not unlike the current guy, President Trump, who just won, said he was pulling the chain on all this stuff, too. Um, one thing about President Obama, if you didn't notice already from all his other policies, um, President Obama, to be sort of blunt, is a creature of the faculty lounge. He likes to uh, spend a lot of time thinking and reading and discussing and not a lot of time pulling the trigger. Okay, so um, it, it was, what he did in this war or with Guantanamo or with health care or with taxes or you pick your subject, a lot of talk and not much action. Okay, so um, the same thing happened there. I think I think some of his advisors convinced him to just stick with the standard go long strategy, and that's you know we did a little surge like we did in Iraq. But I mean, think about it. He condemned the Bush surge and then he repeated it. Yeah. I mean, so it's really difficult to say. I, I think in the long run, um, you know, President Obama is going to have to answer. You know, historians. You know, he, he's too currently out of office for a lot of it to happen. But as people look at it, there, there's going to be some fingers pointed for the reasons you said. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, my neighbor, uh, when I was a child, worked for the company. And uh, I chose intelligence when I served. Uh, your comment was that the, uh, and I had respect for it. Now, this was 50 years ago, but I thought it was pretty good back then. Uh, your comment was intelligence wasn't too hot, and I want to know what happened. Uh, you know, a funny thing, and you know this because you work in intelligence, the intelligence people um, they, they collect and they analyze, and they provide it to decision makers. But the decision makers have to read it, and they have to pay attention to it. We know from, there, there have been nine separate investigations, for example, of the Pearl Harbor attack in 1941. And those investigations will show you that had people like President Roosevelt, the Navy guys, the Army guys, you know, taken the time to actually look at everything, they could see what was going to happen. The 9-11 committee investigation is excellent. If you haven't read it already, it's actually very well written. It's easy to read. Um, and they showed the same thing, that, that the Clinton and Bush administrations should have seen what was going to happen because our enemies have said clearly, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do it this way, all that kind of stuff. But intelligence is only as good as the people's, uh, the, the decision makers' ability to accept it. As Americans, and I can say this as an American military guy, we have a tendency to, and this is particularly hard for me because I am like a school trained historian and all, you know, written books and all that junk, but we have a tendency to sort of put ourselves in an exceptional category. I mean, I actually heard people say the British guy would come up to us in Afghanistan and go, hey, you know, bloke, uh, I wanted to tell you, you know, when we invaded this country, it didn't go well. Here's what went wrong. Oh, get out of the way, man. We're not British, you know? I mean, and I know in 1965 we told some French guys that in Vietnam too. Yeah, yeah. We, we have a tendency to trust ourselves too much. And just because we have preponderant economic military power, we think, you know, the, the rules of physics don't apply to us. So I would tell you, I think as, when the truth comes out, and some of it has already, the intelligence was there, but the decision makers ignored it or, or you know, just chose not to use it until it was too late, sadly. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. I got sworn in as an American citizen on March 18, 2011. I'm very proud of that step yeah, that I took. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. I swore to abdicate allegiance to any potentate, foreign potentate. Why is this not enforced to Muslims coming to this country who are faithful to their holy book? Clearly, they cannot be both faithful to their holy book, and faithful to what this country stands for. When do, are we done with political correctness? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, yeah, I mean when, you've asked an excellent question. And I when mean, again, are we done seeking the enemy over there when it's here? 
Right. Yeah, no, I mean, do you want me to disagree with you? Because I wouldn't. I mean, uh, no, I think, I mean, look, I, I'm an American citizen too. I'm not wearing a uniform anymore. I, I you know, I vote, I do all that kind of stuff. But, but I would just tell you, um, the laws are on the books. The Constitution applies to everyone. Um, the, the, the oath that you swore in front of the American flag on that happy day when you became a U.S. citizen applies to every U.S. citizen. And we just have to have the will to, to you know, sort of apply it to ourselves. And, uh, and you said, you know, when are we going to be t done with political correctness? I will tell you, we will need to get done with it or it will, it will fill it, finish us. So my home country is Germany. Yeah. You all here know what's going on over there. Absolutely. Yes. It, we cannot let this happen here. I don't know what can be done. I'm just, you know, a civilian. No, no, <laughs> but I know. But it, it, it cannot, it cannot. No, you're, here. you're exactly right, I, and I, I agree with you. But, but a lot of it is will. And, and ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know this already, I mean, the the people that are elected work for us. I know that sometimes in Washington they act like we're we're their serfs and stuff. But, uh, but you know, we the people is the first three words of the Constitution. I would offer you the following. Um, you know, think of how many of your friends don't vote, don't do, you know, when they don't do that, you know, they, they're screaming into the wind if they're complaining about these things. You got, you have to take an interest. You know, politicians do listen to noisy voters. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything illegal, immoral, wrong, you know, but make your voice heard. It's totally lawful. It's, you know, it's, it's part of our duties as citizens. That's good. Hi, so, um. I'm actually hoping to transfer to NC State, so if I need a history class, I'm going to right. sign up to you. <laughs> that'll, that'll work. <laughs> because I don't really like my teacher right now at Lake Tech who teaches history. I don't well, like her very much. Go. But um, uh, I basically, I apologize if this is kind of an obvious question or whatever, but you're talking about the enemy strategy on, you know, they have those four steps that they constantly do. Um, have we, as, you know, as the U.S. military um, tried anything that would kind of trap them in their own like s system. I don't know. I mean, if yeah. they've got this, then maybe we can find a way around it. I don't know. No, I'm you're curious. exactly right. Um, <laughs> uh, we have, but but that's that method that Mao Zedong um, codified has been historically effective for guerrilla insurgent forces. In other words, it, it it basically plays on the weakness of conventional disciplined militaries, which we have. So there, there are ways around it, but they're very difficult, and they require you to use measures that are tough. One of our uh, questioners made the comment. They said, if you take this seriously, you would take the following attitude. So 150 years ago, if you were caught behind enemy lines in civilian clothes carrying weapons, you were shot, summarily executed. All right? Nothing that says we couldn't do that now. Now people may say, oh, but this the Hague Convention, the Geneva Convention. It's like, hey, you know. I mean, most of the people we fight don't follow those. Yeah. You know, we choose, you know, again, if we want to fight like this with one arm behind our back, you know, Marcus of Queensbury rules, okay. But, you know, if you want, if you want to be effective, you've got to take the gloves off. You've got to go in hard. You've got to be like Mike Steele's guys and go in and, and be the baddest guy there. And there's just no doubt about it. And when you are, you know, I will quote from our, our great enemy, Osama bin Laden. He said, when people see the strong horse and the weak horse, they naturally defer to the strong horse. You know, we should have probably listened to him. One more. Second, everybody. Thank you for your service, sir. No, it's uh, my honor. When, when President Trump ran for office, he said that he wanted to halt immigration from certain Muslim countries until he found out what the heck was going on. And uh, I was just wondering if he found out what was going on, because it seems like there is a universal, I mean, not just in the United States, but like in Germany, Sweden, France, Great Britain, there's a universal memo that was sent out about, I mean, it, it appears that way. Oh, yeah, it seems, I, I mean, all of these countries are in the same boat. So what the heck is going on? What happened? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's a great question. But what I would say, and again, I'm an observer of this just like you are. I'm a U.S. citizen, but I try to follow the news. From what I can tell, um, there's a belief that, it, that it's against our values I don't know when it became the right of all seven billion people in the world to arrive at the door of the United States. I don't know when that <laughs> became. But, but, um, but I do know that it's very difficult for, for elected leaders in Western countries who are under rule of law to say the kind of harsh things that need to be said. So in campaigns, we're starting to hear it now. 
I, I mean, again, if you believe the current president's Twitter account and stuff, I mean, he, he apparently is still committed to all that. Um, how he's going to do it is going to be tough because we've got a lot of people who are not. And if you think this is unusual to the United States, I would urge you to read the multi-volume set by Edward Gibbon called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Because, because the majority of countries that, that pass through their period of ascendancy and end, it's usually self-inflicted. I mean, very rare. I mean, yeah, the barbarians came over the wall eventually, but the Romans had, laid, had knocked the wall down. They'd let them in. And, and, and that, that's the real challenge you have here. Will we have the willpower to enforce our own laws and constitution? I think the U.S. laws and constitution are good. I think, I think we have systems of immigration that are fair and equitable and will allow people who want to come here and be Americans to do so. But we've got to have the guts to do it. And, you know, when, we're, when we have situations where, you know, we have people living here illegally and we're afraid to even say it, you know, I mean, it, it's crazy. So what is going on? Yeah. Yeah, very difficult. And it, and it, think about it, you know, put yourself in the position that I was in, you know, talking to my son, who's a veteran of Iraq, Afghanistan, talking to the families of people who died in this war. You know, they turn to you and say, you know, is this, is this why my son or daughter, this happened to them, so that I, my own country now is at risk, you know? Yeah. And it, it's hard to look them in the eye. Yeah. 